Today's video is on the treatment of hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease. This video's objectives are to discuss the use of DDVP in mild hemophilia A and von Willebrand disease, the use of antifibrinolytics, the use of coagulation factor concentrates for bleeding control and for prophylaxis, and then recognizing signs of an inhibitor antibody. So DDAVP um, is an analog of vasopressin hormone and in large doses will cause the increase in circulating levels of von Willebrand factor and the factor eight bound to it two to three times the baseline level. It does not, however, increase the production of these and that's important. One of the three side effects um, is tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis is the term for a waning response to a continued dose of the drug. And this is a case of this drug. As the supply of the, of the uh, clotting factors is consumed, the dose has less and less response. The drug can be given commonly IV or intranasally. And its side effects are water retention and headache and facial flushing and the tachyflux, as I mentioned just now. Of the three, headache and facial flushing is common and is the most easily treated, as this is generally rate of infusion dependent and can be uh, treated with uh, Tylenol and then slowing the rate of infusion. The side effect that's of greatest concern is water retention. Water retention can cause potentially life-threatening severe hyponatremia, and therefore this drug has to be used with a great deal of caution, and no free water access should be used um, around the dose of this drug and for approximately eight hours after. Generally speaking, I advise families to have their children drink Gatorade or other uh, salt-containing fluids, and in terms of IV fluids, I use uh, normal saline, uh, and I restrict to uh, just maintenance fluids, or perhaps even less than that if I'm uh, uh, concerned about the risk of water retention. DDVP is um, capable of raising von Willebrand's factor two to three times its baseline, and as I mentioned, factor eight will rise with that. However, if your, fam if your patient's baseline level is too low, in the case of moderate or severe deficiency, the effect is not clinically useful, even if seen. Um, if you go from 2% to 5%, you know, you're having a biologically appropriate response, but you're not getting anything valuable out of it. If your patient's bleeding challenge, uh, for example, surgery is going to be in a location where any loss is dangerous, say uh, bleeding into the brain, or uh, is likely to last for more than a couple of days, uh, like say orthopedic procedure where there's a lot of bleeding in the surgery and then there's uh, post-surgery physical therapy, um, uh, where then the tachyflux of DDP will make it less useful. So in these, in these cases, um, even if a person is known to respond to the drug, it's passed over and factor concentrates are used. Antifibrinolytics are drugs which inhibit plasmin destruction of fibrin. And the two that are in common use in North America are tranexamic acid, which has a brand name of Listeta, and is used frequently in um, treatment of menorrhagia in young women, um, and then epsilon aminocaproic acid, or Amicar. Both can be given IV or orally, um, and tranexamic acid is more powerful um, in terms of a dose response uh, for a milligram by milligram than Amicar. However, um, Amicar is easier to get. Uh, so Amicar is oftentimes used even if tranexamic acid uh, may be a, a more powerful agent. Um, both are used in mild hemophilia to aid DDP um, and are used frequently in the treatment of oral bleeding. Um, dental work, for example, uh, and some ENT procedures. Care has to be taken to avoid this drug class, though, in boys who have hematuria. And there are boys with hemophilia who have what's called chronic benign hematuria of hemophilia. And this is a low-volume, low, free, low volume, um, 
um, bleeding into the urinary tract. And um, if you give this agent um, to a person with this condition, they will clot in their ureters uh, and result in uh, acute kidney injury and uh, obstructive uropathy. Antifibrolytics um, uh, can be given either as pills or liquid, um, even though um, most adults usually prefer pills. The small size for the pills uh, in terms of um, milligrams per pill makes them impractical for most adults, and so liquid tends to be used. Um, read the FDI guideline for further um, uh, uh, diagnose further information on that if you need. Um, the uh, tranexamic acid can be given as an oral pill in the form of a steta or a liquid solution. The solution usually is compounded by a pharmacist into an uh, aqueous solution and works well, but uh, requires a pharmacist with access to those drugs and a compounding ability. And then the pills are large, um, whereas the Amacar potency of each pill is small. The pills themselves are, are normal size, and tranexamic acid pills are, are substantial and are difficult for a child to swallow, particularly if they've had oral uh, surgery recently. So the treatment of acute bleeding uh, is done with a factor plan. The factor plans are dependent upon the nature of the injury, a high velocity injury or a fall, the potential for organ or structure damage or life-threatening bleeding, um, the time between the event and your treatment, and the expected compliance of the patient. Um, for example, a person who has a fall uh, from a stair uh, lands on their um, shoulder, has a risk of bleeding into their uh, latissimus dorsi or their uh, biceps or triceps muscle, um, and a relatively simple problem. A person who falls on that step and lands on their head has a more difficult problem. A person who falls on the step and tries to catch their fall and then jams their wrist has another kind of problem. The uh, potential for organ or structure damage is an important factor. Closed or hollow spaces are a risk for ongoing bleeding um, and or damage uh, from that ongoing bleeding uh, uh, and are a different um, concern than some bleed into a muscle. The time between the event and your treatment, the more time passes, the greater the amount of blood loss and the greater potential for local damage. And so then not only do I want to factor that person up, but recognizing that I may well have to do something in terms of intervening for the blood, I want to probably put that patient in the hospital for at least overnight, and I want to make sure that, that I have uh, access to appropriate uh, surgical therapy um, if I need. And then obviously the factor plan would have to count that in as, as part of the plan. And then the expected compliance of the patient. If I have a patient who lives, uh, you know, two miles away from the hospital, I can have them come back to clinic the next day. But if I have a patient who lives on a farm two miles away from the little town they live in, and that's 20 miles away from the next big town, and they're 100 miles away from me, then I'm going to have a difficult problem to do if I try to do them with home therapy the next day. I'd rather put them in the hospital, get them stabilized, and then do home therapy once we have a stable patient. So life-threatening bleeding risks occur in various parts of the body. And that one of the rules you need to remember about treating hemophilia is the amount of bleeding visible on the outside of the head is not necessarily reflective of the bleeding inside the head. And this can be thought of for all hollow structures of the body, but this is particularly important in the brain. As people can have ragingly nasty looking hematomas on their face and be completely normal, happy little children. They can have a small little knot, a little a bruise on their face and be in deep trouble with bleeding inside their brain. So it's important 
when you think about head injuries or think about bleeding into the hollow parts of the body, that you recognize that the outside isn't necessarily what's going on on the inside. Another thing to remember is that the muscles of the paraspinous region, particularly in adults or in uh, adolescent boys, can uh, hold a lot of blood. In the psoas muscles, uh, two units of blood would be an easy thing for them to hemorrhage into. Same with the obturator muscles and the other muscles of the hip girdle. So in addition to the uh, need to stop bleeding, you may need to watch for anemia, you may need to watch for um, uh, local damage from all the hematoma. And so symptoms to think about with intracranial bleeding, headache, dizziness, visual disturbances, um, or lateralizing signs, um, torso, shortness of breath, chest pain, abdominal pain, faintness from loss of blood, back, pain along the spine, stiffness, radiating pain, uh, and numbness. Pain on moving the hip would make me think about a back injury with bleeding. Uh, and the back injuries can be muscle. They don't have to be bony. Um, limb bleeding, swelling, numbness, and radiating pain. Um, and we worry about uh, upper arm uh, and other areas where nerves can be compressed. So here's an example of an ankle bleed. And here, if you look at the yellow arrows and you compare the normal knee ankle to the swollen bloody ankle, you'll note that there's a normal external anatomical landmarks on this ankle. And you notice there's really is not as obvious. Um, the malleolus is, is swollen, the area around it's swollen. And the knee or the ankle is held in partial uh, plantar flexion. And you note the x-ray. Along the green arrows, there's this lucency that's referred to as a fat stripe. And that lucency is actually blood blowing up along the, the space between the Achilles tendon and the other structures deep to that. Um, and those are classic signs of an, a bleed in that joint. The bleed will be warm. It will be diffusely tender. There will be pain in the joint, pain in the, in the affected uh, structures that will be non-dermatomal. Um, that is just diffusely t uh, tender. Um, basically, these things look like a, a just a massively sprained ankle, and on x-ray, similarly. So, treatment of an acute bleed. In factor eight, we most commonly use recombinant product, and the most common brand of recombinant product we use in our center is Advate, which is uh, one of several now, but um, that was uh, that is now still our most common. One unit per kilo of factor eight will raise the factor eight level in the uh, circulation of to two percent. So fifty units per kilo will make a hundred percent correction in your factor level, and the half life is about eight hours. So um, one dose of factor to one hundred percent will give you a fifty percent level in eight hours and a 25% level in 16 hours and a 12.5% level in 24 hours. Factor 9 um, is used in combination. Uh, recombinant products are used particularly in children and that recombinant brand is Benefix and plasma derived products are used and one of the um, commonly used brands is Alpha 9 SD Another brand we use is Mononine. Um, and I tell you these brands because I want you to be able to recognize the brands because the families will, will um, tell brand name rather than factor name. Um, uh, one unit per kilo in factor nine will raise only 1%. So 50 units per kilo there only gets you to 50% of normal. And the half-life is a little bit longer at 12 hours. So emergency bleeding, and we're going to use factor eight. We dose to completely correct the deficit, and our dose is 50 units per kilo as a bolus. 
And remember, the nature of the injury and the time between the injury and when they get factor determines the outcome of the bleed. So we image after we give factor. This is critical. You always give factor before they leave your site. All right. After you've given the bolus, we start a continuous infusion of factor to account for the consumption of factor in the metabolic, um, you use uh, metabolic consumption rate, and we try to keep the level at or near 100%. And this calculates to about four to six units per kilo per hour. Now, for a non-life-threatening bleed, we can be a little bit more um, uh, restricted in our use of factor. So if we're, if we're looking at the history and we look at our physical exam findings and we think there's a risk for an organ threat, we treat per life-threatening uh, factor uh, procedure. If not, then you can give 25 to 30 units per kilo and consider a peat bolus later, either 12 hours or 24 hours. And we'll, and we'll continue that for three to 10 days, depending on the nature of the bleed. Um, but we wanna make sure the bleed is sealed completely um, and is um, had a chance to resolve. Now with factor nine, we use the same basic strategy, but we use different calculations because we want to make sure that we account for the less recovery. So instead of 50 units per kilo, we would use 70 to 100 units per kilo. So prophylactic factor. This has been a major change in the last um, 15 years. Um, the use of factor every two to three days can raise the trough level of factor to more than 1%. And this has the effect of reducing target joints. Because the target joints don't form, the joint bleeds don't cause the disability that they would have caused. And this results in um, children who are healthier long-term. Um, our typical dose of factor eight would be 30 to 50 units per kilo, three times a week. Although this can range all the way up to every other day factor. Um, depending on, on um, the individual's kinetics. We try to schedule to spread the doses evenly through the week, and we try to do it on days of peak activity. You know, for example, there's a soccer practice on Tuesdays and a game on Saturday, so our prophylactic schedule would be Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Inhibitors are anti-factor antibodies, which are usually IgG class. They're more common in factor eight, and they mostly occur in severe patients. Um, and they're usually presenting with increase in bleeding or diminished response to factor doses. And what you'll notice in the kid who is on prophylaxis is that they have less minor bleeding. So not only do they have the joint bleed protection, but they don't bleed quite as much with the incidental trauma. And then somebody with an inhibitor we'll start having those bleeds or they'll have a joint bleed as a warning shot. And so when you see somebody whose annualized bleeding rate goes up or you see somebody who's having more minor bleeds than they used to have, thoughts given to an inhibitor. We detect this by finding an abnormal recovery of factor and we can find that by measuring it directly uh, with an inhibitor assay using uh, a Bethesda assay. So a Bethesda assay is measured when the amount of inhibitor necessary to destroy half the circulating factor in one ml of known normal plasma, then uh, that's a Bethesda unit. Inhibitors are classed in terms of low Bethesda units and high Bethesda unit. So a high titer or low titer inhibitor and they're treated, particularly when they're either persistently low or they're high, um, with uh, immune tolerance. Now, the complexities of immune tolerance are beyond the scope of the video, but just to make sure you understand, this is a lot of money. Immune tolerance requires 100 units per kilo per day of factor eight. Factor eight's average wholesale price is about a dollar a unit. 
So a 10 kilo child would require a thousand units a day or a thousand units wholesale, a thousand dollars wholesale uh, per day and would require that for six months. Um, for a bleed, Novo 7 is used and that costs about $7 a microgram and is dosed at 90 micrograms per kilo per dose every two hours till bleeding stops. And so again, that 10 kilo child would require 900 micrograms at $7 a microgram every two hours, plus the cost of the emergency room visit. Um, and so as I described to families, inhibitors are antibodies that consume money. Um, so we're gonna do some review questions. Go ahead and pause your player if you need to, to answer your question. So Tommy's a 10 year old boy with severe classical hemophilia. He's playing little league. He's the on deck circle, a batter hits a foul ball, it strikes Tommy in his right shin and fear to his kneecap about half an hour before you see him. Which of the following should be done first? So, of the choices here, DDVP is used in mild hemophilia, but it really is not useful at all in severe. X-rays are never done until the factor is given. We want to avoid making the local bleeding worse. Morphine may be helpful in making his pain get better, but the factor concentrate and some ice will work just as well. Benefix is a factor nine concentrate and that will not help a kid who's factor eight deficient. Question two, Bill has mild factor eight deficiency with a 20% baseline level. Needs to have a cavity filled and to have dental cleaning. Dental plan, dentist plans to do this with local anesthetic. Of the following options, which would be most appropriate for his bleeding prevention? And the answer is D. Assuming that Bill is known to respond to DDVP, the choices of B or D um, would be um, likely. However, B would result in tachyphylaxis and eventual breakdown and bleeding. Answer C would not provide adequate hemostasis. Um, answer E is inappropriate for uh, minor surgery but would be, of course, the appropriate answer for, for Bill if he had to have um, a major reconstruction of his face or had to have extensive oral surgery. So question three, John has severe factor eight deficiency and a knee bleed that was treated with Advait for five days. It's not getting better. His most recent dose was four hours ago, and his factor eight level is zero. So the following, what are you most likely? And he would have an inhibitor. And this is a relatively common presentation of an inhibitor antibody. The normal dose of factor uh, does not result in improvement when in fact it used to. From here, you could then measure the activity in Bethesda units and consider treatment of the inhibitor. All right, this is the end of this video. If you have any questions, drop me an email at, at uh, jailharper at unmc.edu and uh, uh, go ahead and close the YouTube viewer and it'll take you back to the rest of the Prezi. Thanks, bye.